If you brought your Bibles, how many you brought your Bibles? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that this is God's word? Amen. This is God's holy and infallible word. Do you believe that God can speak to us today as he did the prophets of old? And, and even, even more so today because he's in glory? Do you believe that? So I want you to open up your Bibles today. And this morning, I want to talk to you, I want to speak to you on the subject of trials and tribulations. I know that this is not a topic that we like to hear. But how many of you have gone through some trials? How many of you are going through some trials right now? Well, let me let you know something. If you're not going through trials and you haven't gone through some trials, just hold on because the trials are coming your way. I'm going to tell you something. We as a church, we do a disservice to our people when we say you come to Jesus and everything's going to be akura matata. You know what that word means, right? It means no worry. Everything's going to be bliss. Everything's going to be wonderful. Everything's going to be great. I was at Fresno State. I was preaching at Fresno State and a young uh, man came up to me afterwards, uh, a Japanese uh, foreign exchange student and he says to me, I want to come to Jesus. He says, because my life is so hard, I want it to be smoother. And I began to tell him, I says, well, you know, you come to Jesus, your life may not become smoother. In fact, it may become even harder. And I began to tell him, when I came to Jesus, I lost all my friends. My friends no longer wanted anything to do with me. Not only that, but I was kicked out of my own house. I was homeless for a while until my cousin let me live with her for a while. I was homeless. Things didn't get good. Things got all. Can you imagine if we were, were, were trying to teach the same message that's going on today to the early church? I mean, the other church that was beaten, flogged, and thrown into the lions. Can you imagine that? No, we do a disservice when we, when we say that everything's going to be bliss. I Because I like, they realize very soon that it's not that way. Let, let me just, man, let me just illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's suppose I have a parachute. And I say to you, put this parachute on. Because it's going to make your trip a lot more smoother, a lot more wonderful, and a lot more uh, comfortable. And so you put the parachute on, you get in your seat, and what happens? All of a sudden you realize this parachute is not comfortable. In fact, it's very uncomfortable. This guy lied to me. He told me it was going to be smooth, it was going to be nice, but it's not. He lies. And what do you do? You take off the parachute because you realize that you were lied to. But if I say to you, put this parachute on because we're going to go through some turbulence and we may have to ditch this plane. You're going to put that parachute on and you're going to keep it on because you know that any moment, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it may not be a, a, a flight that is, is a, a, a beautiful, you're going to put it on and keep it on. Why? Because you know that you might have to ditch this plane. And let me tell you something. Jesus says, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 16. You have it? Say amen. I want to tell you, I want to say one verse and one verse only. But it covers the entire verse, and uh, the entire chapter. John, John chapter 16, if you have it, say amen. Verse number 33, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Did you catch that? Why would he say that you may have peace? He says, because in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Did you catch that? There's three things that I want you to notice. This morning, by the grace of God, I shall endeavor to the best of my ability to bring forth a message entitled, You Shall Have Tribulation. And there's three things that I want you to notice. First of all, Jesus himself says, you're going to have tribulation. The second thing I want you to notice is he says, but be of good cheer. Why are we to be of good cheer when we're going to have tribulations? Well, James gives us the answer for that because it's only for a time and it's for a purpose. It's for testing. So when we go through those trials, we're being tested. 
And finally, he says, I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ is triumphant. And because he is triumphant, you and I will be triumphant. Trials are tribulations, testing, and triumph. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Eternal Father, King of the universe, true God of true gods, we come before you in the wonderful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask that you use me as a vessel employed by your spirit to say the things that you would have me say. And therefore, I ask, dear God, that you would guard my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that they, O oh Lord, may be acceptable in your sight, as we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The pastor of a church went to the flea market because he was looking for a, uh, a new lawnmower. And he saw one of his young congregants, little Johnny, selling things. And, and lo and behold, little Johnny had a, a, a lawnmower. So he went up to Johnny and said, hey, Johnny. He says, what you doing? He said, oh, Pastor, I'm trying to raise some money so I can buy myself a new bike. He says, a new bike? He says, well, how much How much you need? He says, well, I only need 25 more dollars. He says, I see that you have a, a lawnmower. I'm looking for a lawnmower. How much you want to sell that lawnmower for? He says, I'll sell it to you for $25 because I need $25. He said, okay. So he starts to pull at it and he starts to pull it and nothing's happening and he checks the gas and he starts to pull it again and pull it and nothing happens he says Johnny are you sure this lawnmower works and little Johnny says oh yeah the lawnmower works but my daddy says sometimes you just gotta wail on it and you gotta curse at it and the pastor says what I'm not gonna curse at it I haven't cursed in a long time and little Johnny said well keep pulling pastor it'll come to you <laughs> You got <laughs> Keep pulling. It is going to come. It, it'll come to you, right? <laughs> sometimes when you're going through those trials and tribulations and you keep pulling and pulling, sometimes it'll come to you. The wrong things. Don't look at me all holier than thou like you don't know what I'm talking about. Come on. Sometimes we, we're going through trials and tribulations. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. You're going to have hardships. He doesn't say you might have tribulations. You, you, there's a possibility that it could happen. As emphatic, as emphatic as his name, he says, you shall have tribulation. So since we know we're going to have tribulation, we might as well prepare for it. How many know what preparative maintenance is? Any of you, any of you have a car? I just spent $400 on my car yesterday. Why? Because I wasn't practicing preventative maintenance. You know what preventative maintenance is? There's a few select people who will actually prevent, uh, practice what's called preventative maintenance. They will, every 10,000 or 15,000 miles, they will get a new oil change in their car. They will have a regular, a regular uh, tune-up on their cars. If they start to hear a squeak in those brakes, they take the squeak in uh, because they know that their brakes are going out. But the most of us wait until we have broke down maintenance. you know what that is? When it's already too late. When your car is already broken down and rather than costing 59 $69 to pay for it, to have it checked out, we're now paying four or $500 to get it fixed. Well, Jesus says we're going to have tribulation. And in the same way, we need to have preparative maintenance. Jesus tells a parable. And in this parable, he introduces two people. A man who built his house upon the solid rock and a man who built his house upon sinking sand. Now, notice in this parable, they both have the winds and the waves and the storms of life hit their house. How many of you know that it doesn't matter whether you're a believer or a non-believer, you're going to have storms in your life. The winds and the waves are going to beat upon your house. But Jesus said the man who built upon the sinking on the sand, uh, his hat, when the storms of life came, his house crumbled and great was his fall. But the man who built his house upon solid rock, the winds and the waves came and they beat against it, but it did not fall. It withstood because it was built upon the solid rock. Let me tell you something. The same is true in our spiritual walk. I have seen time and time again many and women, usually families who build their house upon a sinking sand. They have nothing to do with Christ. They don't come to church. They don't have a, uh, have a hint towards uh, Jesus. They, they don't read their Bibles. They don't know anything. They're spiritually what's the word I want to use? Spirituality in their life is irrelevant. And then the storms come. And the storms will come. And they come to your office. 
after everything has crumbled and they want you to fix it. It don't work that way. I know that's bad grammar. It doesn't work that way. You have to have preventative maintenance. You have to build on the solid rock before the storms come. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because the trials and the tribulations, they will come. And they come for a reason. That's why Jesus said, be of good cheer. Now, why in the world would Jesus tell us to be of good cheer when the trials and tribulations are coming? James chapter 1 and verse 26 says, Beloved, count it all joy. When you go through various trials, why is that? Because your trials are meant to work endurance. When your faith has been tested, it produces endurance. Let me tell you something. When you're going through a trial, it's to test you. Some people don't pass the test. And so what happens when you don't pass the test? You got to take the test all over. That's what happened to Israel. They traveled 40 years in the wilderness of unbelief. And what was their sin? Unbelief. They kept passing over and over and over until they reached the promised land. Until Joshua said, let's go and possess the land that the Lord has promised us. We're going to go through these trials and their times of testing. Because I want to be honest. Let's be honest with each other. When do we grow closer to Christ? On the mountaintop of blessing? are in the valley of affliction. It's there in the valley where our relationship with Christ is solidified. It's there in the valley where God shows up. Just like with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God shows up in the fiery furnace. Did you hear that? When they say, I see three of them in, but there's a fourth man, and he looks like the son of the gods. That's when God shows up. God shows up when we're facing giants with David and Goliath. God shows up when we're surrounded by our enemies like Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat cried out, Lord, we are surrounded by our enemies and we know not what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's when God shows up. When God shows up, everything, he makes all things work for good. That's why the Bible says, "Be," Jesus said, be of good cheer. For I have overcome this world. Because he is victorious. Because he is triumphant. He has seen your tomorrow. Nothing escapes his omniscience. God has already seen your tomorrow. You know the problems that you're going through right now? The situation, they have might caught you by surprise. But they didn't catch God by surprise. God's already seen your tomorrow. Do you hear what I'm saying? God already knew, had the answer to your dilemma, even before you had, you even knew you had a dilemma. And he says to you in Romans 8, 28, all things will work for good to them that love God and are called according to what? His purpose. Did you catch that? Now let me ask you a question. What's the Greek word for all? It's all. It's not some things, it's not most things, but he says all things will work for good to them that love God. Let me ask you a question. Do you love God? I'm talking to you then. He said all things will work for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Oh, that's a tough one right there. According to, this is his program. This is his agenda. God does not serve us. God does not take his orders from us. When, when you are in God's will, when you are in God's purpose, it's going to work out for good. A lot of times we go through trials and tribulations because of our own makings. You hear what I'm saying? When God told Jonah to go and preach into Nineveh, what did, what did, what did Jonah do? Jonah said, I will not. He didn't want to preach to those heathens because he knew that God was merciful. He knew that God would give them grace. He wanted God to judge them because they were so evil and wicked to his people. He said, I'm not going to go there. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Tarsus. So he gets on a ship and he goes the opposite way. And let me tell you something, I don't have time to preach this. But when you're outside the will of God, everybody in the boat suffers. Everybody in your life suffers. When Jonah was on the boat and the winds and the waves began to come and everyone said, let every man cry out unto his God. What's going on? Why is this happening? And Jonah confesses, it's me. Throw me over. 
And what happens? They throw Jonah over and he's swallowed by a great fish. And where does that fish spit him out at? Nineveh. So whether you're doing it God's way or Jonah's way, God's will is going to be done. And he says, in all things, I'm almost done here, will work out for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And I'll close by telling you a story about Joseph. Who knows who Joseph is in the Bible? Joseph was a man, a young boy, that had a gift. God had give him, given him the gift of interpreting dreams. And God's hand was upon him. If you read the story, it's a beautiful story. It takes up a couple of chapters in, in the book of Genesis. But it's a beautiful story. I don't want to ruin the story for you. But over and over, whenever Joseph was going through some hardships, the Bible says, and God was with Joseph. And God was with Joseph. But his brothers became jealous, and they wanted to kill him. But the oldest brother, Reuben, wouldn't let them. So instead, they sold him into slavery. And he was taken to Egypt, and he was sold as a slave to a man by the name of Potiphar. Now, if that weren't bad enough, I mean, it's bad to be sold by your own brothers as a slave. But then he's taken to the household of Potiphar. And Potiphar sees something in him. And he lets him rule his household. But Mrs. Potiphar sees the young Joseph and she wants a little boy toy. But Joseph has nothing to do with it. He ran from her. And so she lies and she says that he tried to rape her. And so Potiphar has, her thrown, has him thrown into prison. So not only is he a slave, but now as a slave, he's thrown into prison in a dungeon because he's accused of a crime he did not commit. Now, if you think that was bad enough, the Bible says that all things work for good, though. When is it going to get good? Well, while he's in that prison, in that dungeon, even the jailer sees something in him. And he exalts him to a position to help the jailer. And it comes to, it doesn't tell us exactly when, but Pharaoh's cupbearer is accused of a crime and he's thrown in that same prison. And the cupbearer of the king has a dream. And Joseph says, tell me your dream. And the cupbearer tells him the dream. And Joseph interprets the dream for him. And it happens exactly as he said it would. And so Joseph, uh, the, 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 uh, the cupbearer says to Joseph, I will remember you, Joseph. But guess what? He forgot all about him. Until Pharaoh had a dream that puzzled him. And Pharaoh called for all the magicians and all the soothsayers and all the prophets to interpret a dream he couldn't remember. And then to interpret that dream. And nobody was able to do it. And then the cupbearer remembered and said, you know, when I was in jail, when I was in prison, I met a Jewish boy who was able to interpret my dream. And the Pharaoh said, bring that man. So they brought Joseph to the king. And guess what happens? Joseph tells him what the dream is. And then he interprets the dream and says, there will be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And the Pharaoh said, seven years of famine, how shall we survive? And Joseph begins to tell him how to survive these seven years of famine by preparing in the seven years of plenty. And so the Pharaoh puts him second in charge of all Egypt. Not only did it work out for his good, but if you think about it, it worked out for good for all of us. Because if Joseph wasn't betrayed by his brothers, he would have never landed up in Egypt. If he, wasn't landed, if he didn't land up in Egypt, he would have never been in the house of Potiphar. 
If he wasn't in the house of Potiphar, he wouldn't have been accused of a crime he did not commit. I know it's going to get better. It's going to get better. Believe me. If he didn't be, uh, wasn't, uh, uh, wasn't accused of a crime he didn't commit, he would have never went to the jail. And if he was never in the jail, he would have never met the cupbearer. And if he did meet the cupbearer, he would have never been able to meet the pharaoh. And if he did meet the pharaoh, he would not have been able to warn the pharaoh of the coming famine. And if he didn't warn the pharaoh of the coming famine, then all of Palestine would have been wiped out, including the 12 tribes of Israel. And if the 12 tribes of Israel would have been wiped out, there would not have been a tribe of Judah. And if there was no tribe of Judah, there would not have been a household of David. And if there was no household of David, there would not have been the son of David, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And if there was no Savior of the world, we are still dead in our sins and trespasses. But thanks be to God that all things work out for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. In this world, you will have tribulation. There's no getting past that. But Jesus said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, dear God, for your goodness and your mercy. And I pray, dear God, that your spirit would just fall upon this congregation. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Perhaps you're here this morning and you're going through some trials right now. Trials that need divine intervention. I'm not talking about the everyday trials that plague the human condition. I'm talking about things that are beyond human hands and you need an answer from God. God knows what your tomorrow holds. And if you need an answer from on high, I just want you to put your hand up and put it right back down. And by that, you're saying, Pastor, would you pray for me? I see those hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anyone else? I see those hands. I'm going to ask that you do something. Let's all stand. Right there, those who raised their hands. As we begin, as we begin to pray, as we begin to pray, just begin to tell the Lord uh, what the situation is. And just promise me one thing. That when God intervenes, that you will let me know that God intervened. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you see these hands that were raised, dear God. You see these hands uh, of your servants and your children, dear God, that need an answer. They're going through some trials. They're going through some tribulations. And Father, you have the answer to their dilemma. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would make a way where there seems to be no way. That you would open up the floodgates of heavens. And as they seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that you would supply everything else in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, dear God, that you would intervene. That they would know that there's a God in heaven that is able to do above and beyond what we could ever think of or imagine. I pray, dear God, that we would begin to hear testimonies of how you are able to intervene in the affairs of mankind. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said, Amen. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may his grace shine upon you and be gracious unto you. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. God bless.